Yes, I, I've selected some questions mainly on on the basis that uh, they go equally ish to to the different contributors this morning. And um, I would say that hopefully uh, those who have spoken will look at the questions and answers, and any that we haven't addressed in this bit, um, they can perhaps. <laughs> Sorry, my dog has just spotted something. Um, <laughs> can uh, I'm going to have to let the dog out. Um, <coughs> quiet. Right. He's behaving. Right. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, the the I'll start now. Chris Hartfield says, um, and this is addressed to Anna and Paddy. Uh, does the widespread uptake of IPM and protected cropping basically boil down to economics? Um, so financial incentives rewards uh, are there to enable development and uptake. Um, so is economic viability really the greatest barrier holding back more uptake of IPM in broad acre crops? So Anna or Paddy? Can't hear you, Anna. I'm happy to take that one whilst um, <laughs> if Anna's trying to sort her sound out. Um, yeah, I think it's a very good point, Chris, and one that's not lost on us at all. That, but I think we see this as more of a two-step process in terms of economics that you've got. The first point is the farmer, the grower, has to take the decision to try something different, and that is effectively an economically stimulated decision. And that could be promoted by something like a financial incentive. It could be driven by a lot of actors, as we've seen in a lot of the talks today. But also there's you know, numerous other policy and other interventions that could change the economic reality to stimulate that decision. But once that decision has been taken, how it remains sustainable is down to that toolkit. You know, we need to increase confidence and that predictability that you mentioned. And the way to do that is to have the toolkit more developed. So that the economic reality for that farmer can be continued confidence to, to manage in a different way. So it is economic, totally, but it's also about supporting them to have a new version of their economics in that instance. Okay, thank you uh, for that. But moving swiftly on, I don't want to eat too much into the time for lunch. You want to eat into your lunch. Um, so Bill Parker, and this is to Henry, given that um, your work clearly shows that IPM is a, is a spectrum, um, well, I guess it's, it's Henry and probably DEFRA as well, uh, is DEFRA likely to identify a threshold score above which they will deem farmers as practicing IPM uh, and therefore able to access payments and below which you will not be able to access payments? Is it as blunt as that? Sorry, I think that's one more for DEFRA than myself. Mm. Can you hear I, me now? I think now? you're right, yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we yeah. can. Great, yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think the Sustainable Farming Incentive is a scheme which is designed to be widely accessible. Um, and some of the design principles are, are geared to that. I, I'm guessing that most of you on the call will be aware of the, the standards which have already been published as part of the pilot or under 2022, and they're available um, at up to three le different levels of ambition. So introductory, intermediate and advanced. And we expect the IPM standard to be developed in, in a similar way. And that's to take into account that um, that spectrum that you've you've highlighted, um, also to take into account people's different starting positions and baselines, and to allow for um, progression uh, within within the standard. So I think, yeah, it's a really good question. Hopefully that answers it. As I said earlier, you know, we're really hoping that engagement on the OPM standard will start from February, and we're really thinking about now um, what sorts of actions it might pay for um, within that standard and we're also potentially thinking about the role of, of output measures in, in how they could be incorporated into a standard um, but there'll be more to come on that. Thanks. Okay thank you. Um, next uh, question from Nicolas Munio julien um, This is to Henry. So do you have figures of pesticide use as a function of the score of IPM adoption? No. Um, unfortunately, for the, the the way that it's set up at the moment, we're uh, collecting 
information from the uh, the IIPM assessment plans, but there isn't a requirement to sub submit pesticide use sheets with that. Um, I know there's some work going on uh, from colleagues in, in Ireland and also in England to look at um, a smaller sample, but look at the full farming business. So you've got everything that relating to the farming business, including pesticide use, and uh, they're actually going to use our metric as well to to at least go some way to marrying pesticide use with uh, IPM score. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one to Sam, um, and this is from Peter Calrick. Has any work been undertaken looking at sowing trap fields rather than borders of turnip rate, uh, sort of within the vicinity, one to two weeks ahead of sowing uh, winter oilseed rate crops, a means of preferentially attracting migrating cabbage stem flea beetle, and then presumably spraying or cultivating to um, get rid of them? Yeah. Okay, it's a good question and it kind of links with one of the other questions which is the area of the trap. Um, in our trap cropping work that we did on pollen beetle we calculated that the area of the trap crop to the crop necessary for um, you know a good function was around 10 percent but we have not tested this um, for flea beetle so we don't really know how big the area of the trap crop needs to be. The question is, would a whole field work? Possibly. We, it's a really good idea and it's something that we do want to test, but it really depends on the scale of the, the mechanism of the attraction. Mm -hmm. So if you sow a whole you know, trap crop um, in a field that's you know, several metres or hundreds of metres away from your main crop, will it work? You know, it's about preference um, for, for the preference of the turnip rake over the oilseed rake crop. So, in, and you saw in our graph um, of the strips at RSPB, actually the, the, the number of larvae started to increase um, the further away from that truck crop we got. So that's suggesting that the, 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 the distance over which the attraction operates isn't that far, but there's, there's only one way to test it and, and that's to have a, have a go. I know Sasha White has also tried this um, in kind of early sown and volunteer crops, which didn't work particularly well. So the answer is I don't know, but I would like to try just to answer that question because it's a, it's a good thought. OK, thank you, Sam. Um, and then last question here to, to Alan from Robert Nightingale. Um, and it's really linking back to the DEFRA question earlier. Do you think that a a national resistance testing scheme of the most relevant insects in the UK from suction traps would be worth government funding? I think the answer is probably absolutely. obvious, but say it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I would say absolutely it is. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm not involved in the research on this, but I, I am in touch with the people who do the work. And it's very frustrating for them to have to go and search for funding every year. Every year, can we have this? Can we have this? It really doesn't need to be as bad as that. I, I blame Margaret Thatcher myself. This would have been government funded had she not intervened in the mid 1990s. Sorry for the politics, but I feel strongly about that. And I think it, we need to go back to that situation where information like this, which is very valuable to many growers, agronomists alike, uh, and without fear or favour, should be funded by the government. It should not be funded by manufacturers. Uh, it should be funded by the government and it should be f provided free to the growers when it's when it's uh, determined. And not just for cereals, it can also be done for potatoes, for sugar beet, for uh, a number of crops, oilseed rape for example as well. Uh, the virus testing now is quite good, it's quite quick. The information could be done in real time uh, but it should be government funded, I think. Okay, thank you. I'm going to push it a bit and, and nibble a bit of lunch uh, time away. So, um, question from Chris Walwork. Sam, uh, if, if you were an oilseed rape grower, and I'm assuming you don't do that in your spare time, do you feel that you have adequate IPM options to allow you to grow a profitable crop without insecticides? Maybe Patrick could answer that one, but... Um, do you yep, want if you wish. Yeah. yeah, you want. Um, I don't think we have uh, that many IPM options, or at least we don't know how effective are they, like surely effective in the field. 
So I would, I would, if I were a grower, I would need more help, uh, like some, like a, they said, a toolbox of IBM, knowing what are the steps and knowing how effective they are and if it's if it's um, profitable against any other control option that I may have. Okay, and thank you. you Add something, Sam, to that? That's perfect, yeah. Uh, yeah. We've lost our own trials. It must be really, yeah, uh, it'd be very difficult to, 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 to be a farmer and to take those risks. Okay, thank you. And then um, a question from uh, Gia Aradotti to Henry. Um, did you start looking at the overall economics of IPM in comparison with um, what might be termed conventional control? Did that form part of your analysis? Um, I suppose there are a few issues there in terms of, uh, well, it's not IPM versus conventional control. Um, so that's one thing, but we can leave that for the sake of lunch. Um, the microeconomics of IPM can be quite hard to decipher and many have tried and many have failed and um, because there are so many interacting factors within the control measures that are developed within uh, the environmental conditions, the agronomic conditions on the farm. I think if we start collecting that data, it needs to be a very large sample um, so that we can start thinking about uh, introduction of weather and the, the, the markets as well, which we, we know grain markets can go up and down. These are all things that will affect IPM decisions, um, whether you're chasing that yield in those uh, better years or cutting your losses in those poorer ones. So it's something I, when I first started looking at this, it's something I really wanted answers to. And I spoke to a loads of economics um, sort of researchers. Uh, yeah, but unfortunately haven't got anywhere as of yet. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I I think I'll hand back to you, Catherine, then people can still rush off and assemble some sort of lunch um, and then we can get back together. If we if we have time at the end of the afternoon, we, we may come back to some of these questions, but if I can encourage all of the presenters to um, look through those questions and type answers, uh, that would be really useful, I think, and hopefully make people feel they've been looked after. Okay, thanks. Thank you, John, and thank you to all the panellists this morning for uh, not just their presentations, which were all excellent, but also for taking part in the questions and fielding some of those. It's always a little bit tricky, but you don't know what's coming, isn't it? So well done, all of you. Um, we're going to break for lunch now. Um, and um, because we've run over a little, just a little bit this morning, we're just going to not come back until 1.40. Um, so um, just sort of uh, bear that in mind when you're coming back. So hopefully I'll have a bit more time for a, um, a, a bit of lunch and uh, we'll see you all later again. Please don't leave the presentation. Uh, just put yourselves, um, we'll just stay current and we'll be, um, we'll be back again at 1.40. See you all then. Thank you.